Hello, church family. My name is Pastor Benjamin Beeks, and as of this past Monday, I am now the pastor of Community Fellowship Church here in Jamestown. Obviously, there are a lot of things happening right now in the life of the congregation and a lot of changes that are taking place as I'm getting settled into this role. I know uh, that there has been a live stream for many months, maybe years at this point, and I'm sure that we will get back to that at some point soon. Uh, but one of the changes that we need to make right now is for, for me to post sermons online in this format. Uh, I'm sure we will get back to live streaming soon, though. But for those of you watching regularly at home, would encourage you to continue connecting with us uh, and connecting with the, the sermons on either YouTube or on our website. Uh, and if there is a piece of the larger service that you really miss seeing, then let me know and, uh, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, but this will be the format that we do sermons in in the next few weeks and months. It is wonderful to be here with you, though, today, and Emily and I are excited to step into this new season of ministry and see what God may be doing in these days here at Community Fellowship. I believe that this is a season in which something incredible and, and new may be happening around us here in Jamestown, even if we don't fully understand what it is just yet. And so Emily and I are excited to be here, co-laboring for you, and co-laboring with you for the sake of the gospel uh, in in uh, Jamestown for the foreseeable future and, and discerning with you where God may be leading us all in these days. With this being our first Sunday together though, generally I do find that this is a good time to share uh, just a little bit about me so that you all can get a better glimpse into the life of Benjamin Beeks beyond just what I do on Sunday mornings. So uh, today I've, I've prepped 10 fun facts about me. So uh, so yeah, let's just dive in. 10 fun facts. Uh, first and, and most importantly, about my favorite person. Uh, my wife Emily and I have been married for just over two years, having gotten married in July of 2021. She graduated from Indiana Wesleyan in December of 21 and now works for the Ronald Blue Trust, which is a financial firm on the north side of Indianapolis. Uh, number two, Emily and I have both separately been to all 50 states. My parents and I, we finished our lap around the states in Ala with Alaska in 2019, and Emily and her family finished theirs with a trip to Alaska this, part this past June, which I got to be a part of too, now having married into the family. Uh, number three, I'm a pastor's kid and an only child, and throughout most of my childhood, I fit most of the stereotypes for both of those things. Please pray for my parents. They're still recovering. Number four, I was a runner in high school, and during my senior year, I was able to run a five minute and 15 second mile. Number five, I cannot do that anymore. I still run, but I used to run for speed. Now I run to finish. Number six, I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Uh, my mom read all the books to me at age five, six, and I did some calculations uh, this week, and at a minimum, I have spent at least 10 days of my life watching the Lord of the Rings movies over the year. Might be more, but I'm lowballing it, hoping that you all won't think I'm insane. Uh, number seven, in college I was part of the Purdue Varsity Glee Club. Uh, so if you saw the Purdue Christmas show at any point between uh, 2014 and 2017, then you got to watch me dance and attempt to look coordinated. Number eight, I am not coordinated. Again, we return to the fact that I was a runner in high school. That was by necessity because I was not capable of doing any other sports. Number nine, I have had a pretty distinct call to ministry since the summer before seventh grade, even though it took me well into high school to say yes to that calling. And number 10, one of my favorite ways to be living out that calling right now is through the microchurch that we call The Gathering that Emily and I have started in our home. We've been meeting with weekly since January. Uh, we really believe in and are excited by this old but made new model of ministry and the ways in which we may be able to may be able to, to reach people for the sake of the kingdom in the years ahead. I could talk all day about that, but I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about the, the gathering later. But, but there you have it, a small glimpse into to my life, into who I am. Uh, and I have so enjoyed getting to sit down with many of you over the last few weeks, get to know some about each of you, and, and even hear some of your hopes and dreams for the, the future of Community Fellowship. And Emily and I both really are looking forward to getting to know each of you more in the months and years ahead. So especially if you don't attend in person, uh, but, but worship with us online, reach out. We'd love to connect with you going forward. Next Sunday, we are going to dive into a series uh, on the Apostles' Creed. But before we do that, today, I want to just take some time and share a little bit of my story and how I've seen God at work in my life over the years uh, and just give a, a small piece of my own testimony. So again, I'm, I'm a pastor's kid. So God, the church, uh, even my own faith, it's just something that uh, has, all, for, for all intents and purposes, always been a part of my story. 
But it was during my, my teenage years that my faith really began to, to take shape and, and become a foundational piece of my life. And, and that was uh, a result of things that, that began in the fall of 09. In November of 2009, I was a healthy 13-year-old boy who just finished my cross-country season. I was about as healthy as any 13-year-old can, can be expected to be, but on November 8th, I woke up for church, started getting ready for the day, and out of nowhere, I, I collapsed in the shower. Now, I was in the midst of one of my more intense growth spurts at, at that time, and so my parents, they told me to, to stay home from church, but all of us, we, we just kind of brushed it off as growing pains. Unfortunately, the, the weakness that my legs were experiencing on Sunday had not gone away when I woke up on Monday. I went to school, but I was moving slowly, so mom called the doctor and, and he told mom to get me in right away. And we heard that at the time as he only had one opening early in the day and he wanted to squeeze me into it while, while he had some time. But the reality is, and we found out later, that the, the doctor knew what was going on from the very beginning. After a lot of testing to, to rule a lot of things out, the doctor admitted me for overnight observation. And this, this was where we started to realize something was probably wrong. After a neurologist came in and, and did another test, I was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, or, or GBS for short. GBS is a rare degenerative nerve disease that eats away at the, the myelin sheath around your nerves. Uh, and as that sheath is destroyed, the, the synapse that goes from your, your brain to your hand to tell it to move, it, it starts to slow down and, and you get weaker and weaker until uh, you're, you're fully paralyzed. It's a rare enough disease that it, it, it often goes misdiagnosed for uh, several weeks or even months, but we were really lucky that my doctor put the pieces together and, and realized what was happening in my body. Because you see, GBS is a, a rare, and, and when I say rare, I, I mean one in a million, but a rare side effect nonetheless of the seasonal flu vaccine, which I had received on October 30th, 10 days prior. Now, we also like to be really clear here, and we've been saying this for over a decade, even before it was controversial to say, but my family, we, we are not now, nor have we ever been or, or ever will be an anti-vaccine family. Vaccines are a good, safe, and, and healthy thing that protect us all from various diseases. My story is very much the exception and not the rule, so, so please don't hear this as a reason to, to not get your seasonal flu vaccine this fall, or in general to, to disregard doctor's recommendations or, or even orders in your life. To make a long story short though, I was in and out of the hospital then for the next two months, and coming out of the hospital then, I was so weak that it was a celebration when I was able to walk a tenth of a mile without a walker or a cane. Then in January, I started dealing with extreme neuropathy, uh, shooting pain in, in my nerves from literally my head to my foot. I was in constant pain for a month until they were finally able to get me on some medications. But then when you stuff a 13 year old boy full of a dozen or more high dosage medications, the physical pain may have worn off, but the emotional pain began to set in. I sank into the deepest, darkest depression I have ever been in and I, I reached a place that I was ready and, and willing to take my own life. 2010 included multiple therapists, outpatient counseling, and, and three separate inpatient psychiatric admissions, just trying to get my mental health under control. While the physical challenges were far from over, the emotional challenges took center stage for much of 2010, and this physical and emotional battle continued then for the rest of the year. In January of 2011, my family reached a breaking point. I had been to a full week of school maybe three times since November of 2009, I was being bullied to an extreme at school, and, and a few days into second semester of my freshman year, I, I outright refused to return to school. I was done. And my parents were so emotionally spent at that point, I think they knew that they weren't able to continue fighting that battle anymore. We discussed several options, but agreed that it was time for me to, to change schools. And after a week or so then, we all agreed that we would give Delphi Community High School, which was about 20 minutes down the road from Monticello, uh, that, that we would give Delphi Community Schools a, a shot best decision we ever made. I had not been to a, a full week of school since probably August of 2010. I began at Delphi Community High School on either January 12th or, or 13th of 2011, and I then proceeded to miss two days of school for the rest of that semester. I transferred into to Delphi, academically ranked somewhere in the, the middle third of my class, somewhere around number 35, uh, and I, I graduated number seven. I had lost all semblance of connection and community at Twin Lakes, but I gained more at Delphi than I ever lost at Twin Lakes. I can't say that starting in January of 2011, I had a perfect high school career, but man, am I ever thankful for the change. I say this in the most matter of fact way that I possibly can when I say that, that Delphi Community High School quite literally saved my life. 
And there's a lot more to that story, of course. And, and if you want the full details, my dad actually wrote a book detailing our family's story and, and journey with GBS a few years ago. It's called In Our Darkest Hour, Hope by Brian Beeks, and you can, can find it pretty easily online. The issue is, we wrote the book about five years too soon. We thought the GBS story and how God worked through it all in, in my life ended when I graduated from Delphi in 2014. But then I got a phone call from the pastor of Delphi Methodist Church in the spring of 2017, asking me if I was interested in an internship, filling in for the youth pastor that summer who was going to be away on a small sabbatical. And once again, my life changed in a very dramatic way. I spent the next two summers interning at Delphi Methodist Church, and, and I continued to volunteer in various capacities during the rest of the year. I spent four and a half years volunteering with the youth, and, and then ultimately, I was hired on to spend three incredible, though chaotic beyond belief years as the Associate Pastor of Music and Worship Arts at Delphi Methodist Church. And to add to that, I quite literally married into the, the Delphi Methodist Church family in the process, as I married the youth pastor's daughter in the summer of 2021. And I am now blessed beyond measure to, to count one of my best friends and co-workers in ministry as my father-in-law. And I don't believe that a, a single thing that I just talked about, good, bad, or otherwise, would have happened if not for GBS. I really believe that if not for seven semesters of school at Delphi Community High School, that the, the Delphi Methodist pastors would have even thought to have given me a call, thus starting the chain of events that led to five incredible and formative years in Delphi. For some of you, you may feel like that's a, a really morbid statement. I mean, seriously, Ben, some of the best moments of your life are, are a result of one of the worst things that ever happened to you? Yes, absolutely, a thousand times yes. Today, I'd like for us to, to look at a scripture that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Turn with me to, to Romans eight twenty two to 30. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for, for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. We misuse and abuse Romans 8.28 a lot. We use it when people die and when people are sick and when times are tough. And we tell each other that it's God's will or a part of God's plan because the plan that he has for our lives, it's totally good. And so nothing meaninglessly bad could ever happen to us. No. Life is hard. Bad things happen. People die. Pandemics come and go. Nations rise and fall. Denominations go through messy divorces. And those things happen because we live in a broken and sinful world that is but the tiniest, tiniest imperfect foretaste of what a perfected eternity is going to look like. But just because something bad happens to you does not mean that it's God's best plan for your life. I, I don't believe for a second that when I was in the hospital or when I was wanting to just die and get it all over with, that God was sitting up on his throne in heaven thinking to himself, yep, that is right where I hoped he would end up. No. What I believe is that sometimes life is just hard. This passage in Romans 8 isn't talking about how following God means that our lives will be cheerful and easy and everything will be good all the time. This passage, it's about a people who are caught up in suffering and turmoil. And we're not just talking about a little bit of hard times here and there, but we are, are talking about a suffering that is so great that they have reached a point in their lives where they don't even know what to pray for anymore. And they can only manage to get out wordless groans. Paul tells the readers in verse 22, 
we know that the, the whole of creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Paul knows that it is not just these people in this time and place who are having a rough go of things. All of creation has been groaning in pain, knowing that something better is possible, that something better is coming, and we're just not quite there yet. But we, believers in Christ, we know why we feel discontent here. We know that this world is not our home and that the best is truly yet to come. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Which does not mean that all things in our lives will be good, but instead means that out of all things, as we seek to follow God's plan, direction, and will for our lives, that God can take anything and bring good out of it. And if the last 14 years of my life are, are not a testament to that, then I don't know what is. God has brought immeasurable good out of the darkest places in my life. And I really don't think I have any other option at this point but to glorify and praise him for the rest of my days for all that he's done. But I know that that's not been everyone's experience. I know that some of you have suffered immeasurable grief and loss in your lifetime and that there has not been some sort of incredible resolution or reconciliation that has taken place. But read the whole context of Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those that he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Does that paragraph end with, and those that he justified, he gave wonderful lives with happy little bows on top of them? No. For those who love God and have been called according to his purpose, God knows us. He makes us like him. He calls us. He makes us right before him. And then ultimately he glorifies us for all eternity with him. Yes, sometimes all things working together for good means that God will take the worst parts of our lives here on earth and work it together for, for good here on earth. Absolutely that is possible. But sometimes all things working together for good just means that despite the worst that this life has to throw at us, God has something far better and far more eternal waiting for us on the other side. The whole trajectory of this passage, even beyond what we just read, points not to an earthly reality that all things here on earth will be good, but instead points to a, a heavenly reality, that because of our faith in Jesus, we have hope that, that God will use the worst parts of this life for his eternal glory. As Christians, we're a people of hope. We have hope that God is with us. We have hope that God is for us. We have hope for a better tomorrow. And, and most of all, we have hope for eternity with our Savior. Church, I can't tell you what tomorrow brings for any of you individually. And, and I can't tell you what tomorrow brings for community fellowship at large. But what I do know is that our God is still on the throne. And that through the ups and downs, through the best and worst that this life has to throw at us, God continues to work all things in creation together for our good. Regardless of what life throws at us, we serve a God who will never leave us or forsake us. We serve a God who loves us and desires to be in relationship with us. We serve a God who desires to spend eternity with us. And we serve a God who is good yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Even when life isn't, God is still good. Church, you are loved by the God of the universe, and I hope and pray that sitting here listening to, to one sermon a week is not the only offering of love or service that you give to him in response, but instead may your whole lives be in service of telling the world about this good God that we serve, who wants nothing more than to work all things together for your good.